Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about money. Now, money is a really, really odd thing because if we're to do a job that we love, then money, it's a bit like that. You know, I mean, everybody says it who's doing what they love, they're they're like, well, yeah, the, the money's something, it's, it's not nothing, but it's not really an affecting factor. They would do the thing that they do anyway, uh, with, with money or without money. So let me put this into a certain context because this draws into my philosophy on money uh, in its current manifestation. So imagine that you're like a builder. But I'm not, I don't mean you're just a builder and you kind of do it and it's like, yeah, it's all right, but I trade it for something. I mean, you're a builder and you love building and, and you live for building and you love building new houses. You love the intricacies of it. You love putting all the um, guttering on the houses. You love putting all the pipe work in the houses, things like that. You you know, you, you can do practically the works you can you can fit the doors you can do the brick laying you can uh you know any carpentry and things like that that need doing you i mean you bloody love this this thing right um and and as i say you can do practically the works in terms of what a builder can do imagine if you win like two million quid on the lottery are you really gonna quit building and the fact is, no, you're not going to quit building. The money becomes... You know, the way I think about it, it becomes the comfort of an old man. An old man is retired. He has money com coming in from the government, from private pension, from personal investments, whatever. Um... And so he just does what he does. And the money's there in the background. You don't need to worry about money. That's what it's like. It's like, well, you've got this million or two million. It's there in the background. But you're going to still do that building. And chances are, yes, you might have a bit of a rest for a while or whatever. But you're going to go back to doing the building to the same level, to the same amount of time that you were doing it previously anyway. Because you love it. Imagine if you're a barista in a coffee shop. Not, again, someone who just does it as a, as a job, but one of those baristas who take pleasure in the art of, of making coffee and they put all those lovely little designs on the top of the, the coffee um, and maybe some of them put names on top of the coffee and they, they have this huge selection of these metal templates and they love to collect them and that's what they do in their spare time as well as doing the job and on a Sunday morning when they make their coffee, they have at home a, a really good coffee maker. They grind the beans themselves. They have all of these templates at home. They do it as a passion, as a as something that they absolutely love. Again, in that situation, do you think that person getting two million quid on the lottery or a million quid on the lottery is going to change anything? They're not. Every Sunday, they're still going to make themselves that coffee. They're still going to make their spouse that coffee or their kid that coffee or whatever it is. They're still going to do that. So money is brilliant and getting money is brilliant. But ultimately, when you get enough money to support yourself so that then you don't have to work, if you do what you love, you're not going to, nothing's going to change. The only thing that's going to change is you're going to have this old man mentality of like, well, you know, I've got this money. I don't need to say anything uh, to anyone. I don't need to take shit from anyone because I've got money, you know, and that's that. And that's, that's basically what it is. Now, there's other situations where you say, well, you're not doing what you love. Well, for a start, why the hell are you not doing what you love? You say, well, maybe it's circumstance. Okay, yeah, there's a fair argument for that, that it's circumstance. Um, I would say that if it is circumstance, 
uh, and you're really not doing what you love, it would be advisable to maybe do what you love in the time periods where you're not at work. Uh, Charles Bukowski did this where he was working loads of different jobs, but he was writing in the evenings and he was writing in the mornings whenever he could. Um, and I mean, now after he's died and even at the end of his life when he was still alive, he, he made it, you know, he became uh, what we would deem in, in normal social terms. And this is problematic in itself as a conception of success. But we would deem he was a success in the normal way of, of measuring success, let's say. Um, so that's what I would say in that situation. And then at least you're allowing yourself access to that realm of experience of doing what you love um, in that time period. And it's not, it's not that let's say you're, you're becoming quite, what's the word? Um, don't know whether conceited is the right word. I don't know. I'm not sure, but you're becoming quite angry because you've not felt as if you've got what you wanted in life you're, you're you're kind of settling in a way but the thing is when we do this it's a victim role for one so it's your saying well i've got this job you know i can't really do it i've not got these options i've not got the ability to do these things all the rest of it when actually you have got the ability to do them you have got a little bit of time it's just that you're kind of thinking, well, you know, I've, I've not got the time I've, or I've, uh, I'm doing this job and that's wearing me out. And so I can't do it when I'm back at home and stuff. Well, you're thinking that situation. Well, maybe look at your health, maybe think, right, is there something in your diet that you can put and improve? Is there something that you can do exercise wise that you can improve, which will then lead to having more energy after uh, every day you've done your job? And then that means that you can, in that time, do something that you're passionate about, whether that producing artwork, whether that producing poetry, or whether that be doing some sort of course that allows you to um, progress in a, in a different field. For example, maybe you uh, sign up for the Open University, or maybe you do, you know, I'm just relating this to myself here, but uh, maybe you do a course on psychoanalysis, and then you can go down the route of counselling, if that's particularly something that you feel would be more of your calling, let's say, as, as we would um, define it in Western culture. So doing things like that, it gets you out of this kind of expectation. It gets you out of this kind of um, feeling as if you are the victim. It gives yourself more discipline. It gives yourself more structure. And ultimately, it, it humbles you in a way as well because you think well instead of me thinking oh well I've not got the time I've not got this I've not got the other uh there's all this thi these things I want to do but my job is stifling me or this thing is stifling me well instead of thinking like that you start to open up and you start to think hang on a minute if I can maybe do half a page of writing or if I can do a poem, or if I can do uh, one piece of artwork, or if I can do whatever it may be, it doesn't really matter, in this little time that I've got before work, or this little time I've got after work, on a daily basis, bloody hell, that adds up. If you think you can do a poem after work, and bear in mind, you know, we don't want to force poetry, we don't want to just do a poem for the sake of doing poetry, um, so maybe some nights you don't do it, because you're not feeling it and you're not really feeling the, the poetic kind of juice, which is, is fairly right in my opinion, that you wouldn't do a poem if you're not feeling it. But let's say that every three days or every two days you, you can do one. I mean, you've got hundreds of poems a year there that you've done. And then obviously in the other times that you've got in the weekends and the bits and bobs of time that you have in the evenings and stuff, you can start structuring a book around that. You then if you can't use Photoshop or you can't use anything like that, then what you do is you um, go to someone who can. I mean, there's many, many places online that you can sort these things out. You get a cover done from someone online like that. 
um, and then you you upload it to Amazon Kindle Publishing. If you've got a little mo bit of money set aside, because of course you're, you're working, so it's not like you've not got any money, you could probably set aside a bit of money, and then you can advertise it, and you can try and get yourself out there, promote it in some way. I don't know what Facebook ads are looking like these days, or Instagram ads, but maybe that's a good way to do it. Maybe you could set up a YouTube channel for your poetry, and record it, and then maybe, um, again, with that little bit of money you've set aside, it, it might be worth looking into YouTube advertising, it might be a little bit expensive, but then again, it's getting your name out there a little bit, and you see what you're doing, you're building up something um, on the side, and you're building up something on the side that in the future isn't a side thing, but is your main thing, um, And it, it, but it's just like, you have to get over and it's been many, it's been, God, it's been terrible for me doing this, getting over this level of expectation and and victim role. And I would say that I'm still getting over it, to be honest. But it, it's very, very hard to get over that ego, that, well, no, I, I want to just sit down, slob out, and I, I'm going to do my job in the day, and that's that. Um, but you see, that's why so many people don't get anywhere because they do the job and then they go home and then they sit whatever do what what do what they want they do what they want um in terms of a leisure activity but then they don't get anywhere and then it's quite funny they have they have i suppose you would say hypocrisy in a way they they moan about it for the fact that they've done what they wanted to do in that moment of, of watching TV or watching TV successively for weeks and upon weeks upon weeks. They've not done the work. And then they moan about the position of it that they've got themselves in. They moan about the position that they themselves have put themselves in by not doing the work. So it's like, well, you can't do, well, you can do that. Because to be honest, if you're supporting yourself and if you've got a house of your own, then you have the right to moan. Of course, we all have that right. Um, but still, it's a bit like, well, don't moan because you had the opportunity, but you just didn't do it. Now then, well, people say to me, well, Adam, surely there's many people out there who have worked in the evenings and worked um, in the time that they've got outside of their work and they've just not got anywhere with their life. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, there's case and points with this. Like I've said, Charles Bukowski, I mean, he he worked for years and years and years before he ever made it as a writer or a poet. And it was only really the latter part of his life that he made it. Um, but then again, he did still make it. We've got another uh, point, actually, Colonel St Sanders, the uh, owner of KFC, again, he worked for years and years and years and had multiple, multiple, multiple failed businesses. And then when he was like 60 odd, again, towards the latter part of his life, he made it and he got a little bit of success. Um, the fact is, if you work well, and you really are interested and it really is a passion for you, I don't think there's many instances where it does fail and where it just falls down. I really don't think there is. And even if there is, who cares? Who bloody cares? Right, I, and I'll tell you for why. Because I don't see my life in the context of my life. I don't care. And I, I'm dead. I'm dead. As soon as I was born, I was dead. Because of causality. Because Every cause is fated to have an effect. And if every cause is fated to have an effect, we all know this in very basic general terms. When you are born, you are fated to die. I am dead. So it doesn't matter what I do. That's it. I'm gone. So it doesn't matter whether I was, would to fail or to succeed in anything. That's just, that's just an conceptual idea that, we, that we've fixed ourselves to. Even if you have the best success in the world with all the riches you can think of in your wildest dreams, it all rots, it all turns to dust and then goes back into the void. Obviously, the great poem by William Shakespeare, um, I can't recite that offhand, but you know, the great globe itself and it'll leave not a rag behind and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's very true. And that was in part the genius of William Shakespeare, being able to 
there's a lot of philosophy in William Shakespeare, reading William Shakespeare's poetry and stuff and being able to discern different ideas within it. There's a lot of kind of um, almost Taoism in, in William Shakespeare. There's a lot of kind of um, ancient Greek philosophy in his in his writings as well and things like that. Um, but no, you know, it's all going to go. So what's the point? You know, you may as well just do... Take your shot. Take your shot. And do... This is how I live my life. I live... I know it's the weirdest thing, but I'm a weird guy. I live as if there's no one in the world today who is... Who can impact my fate. Not one person. Not one individual can impact my fate. And... I am talking right now. I don't talk to, to you, to the people in the 21st century. I, I don't care about, like, I don't, I'm gone. That's how I see myself. I am, I'm dead. I, I am a dead man talking. That's how I talk. When I'm talking on these videos, I am a dead man talking. I am talking transcendentally through the generations. That's what, what I feel. And so, I just talk based on my truth, based on what I see empirically. And I'm talking to people in the future just as a friend, just as some another human who's destined for death. And uh, just to guide them in a way, to give them any little thing that might help them in this very weird, very odd, very... Uh, tragic and also very, very happy experience of life. Money or success or or um, anything like that. Yeah, it's nice to have some money. I'm not going to dispute that. But what's the point? What the hell is the point? The point to me is just to talk and say what I say so that then the next person along can have someone at least who can be a bit of a guiding factor for them and then they can draw their own conclusions based on the observations that they have in reality. Every single philosopher is a, a very, very small beacon of light to the next person along that over hundreds or thousands of years we get some level of what we could call progress, although in my own philosophy, I would contest the idea of progress as a as a concept, really, because of the fact that uh, if we're looking from an absurdist point of view, you know, it's all meaningless. It's all just going to go back into the void anyway. So progress isn't really warranted. It's not really a thing. It's just a um, a very it's a temporal illusion. You would say it's an illusion in set in time. Um, yes, over a very very long time period of generation after generation, but ultimately. You know, the sun's going to expand, it's going to burn the earth, uh, we're going to all die, and then the universe is going to go back into voidness. Um, now, whether we can test the idea that uh, the universe comes back out of that um, and, and springs up again, or whether the universe goes into another universe in some sort of, uh, as I've said before, twister theory or cyclic universe theory, you know, that's by the by, really, because that's a, a new manifestation of the universe or another manifestation of the universe. But ultimately, it's just this thing that goes along and goes along and then may pitter out and then maybe come, come back again. But but that's that. So, you know, it, it's like, well, imagine this. Socrates has been more influential in the years that he's been dead, than in the years he was alive. He has meant more to more philosophers over the last 2,000 years, 2,300 years, something like that, than over the 70, 71 years he was alive. He has expanded, he has touched more people in the time he was dead than, than he was alive. So it's therefore that I start to think to myself, well... The time in which I'm alive doesn't mean anything, really. All it means is that I need to speak my truth. And in speaking my truth, that then 
either gets to people in generations to come or it doesn't get to people in generations to come. But even if it gets to one person, then at least I've kind of almost helped someone who is in line with myself. I've equally helped them as I'm one person, they're one person. They might be in need of some sort of direction within their particular personality or particular men mentality. And so my words kind of spark something inside of them that is aligning to their sp specific brain structure, the way their brain works, their personality, their interests. And then that sends them on their way. So even if it's one person, it doesn't matter. But imagine if I get through to five or ten or a hundred or a thousand over multiple, multiple years. You see how that flowers off? How how many people get inspired by that? And that inspiration, how can you put a price on that? You can't put a price on that. So then for, well, yeah, okay, money's a bit great for me in terms of a bit of comfort in my life and stuff like that. But it doesn't, doesn't provide that level of meaning. It doesn't provide that level of of transcendental inspiration. Well, transcendental maybe isn't the word, but transcendent inspiration may, maybe, or um, macro personal inspiration. No, oh, I'm just screwing up these words today, aren't I? But you get what I mean. You know, it doesn't provide that level of, of inspiration over the generations. It can never do that. It can never really do that. Money can be a great tool. So let's touch upon this for a minute. Imagine if I don't get money, then, and I do these, these videos, then I won't be as cemented in society as certain other individuals. Uh, and then upon my death, I might not inspire as many people because I'll be a philosopher or a psychologist or whoever that isn't as known. But imagine if I do have money, then you can use that as a tool to build something, to build uh, a brand around yourself, to build um, even tangible uh, things associated with your own philosophy, with your own psychology. And then that means you're cemented more. But I mean, this all, all all comes back to this idea of work again. And if you do put in the work, it's very, very likely if you put in a, a good amount of work that you do become successful anyway. And then within that success, you get the money. But the money, therefore, is simply that which to that which allows you to build some more awareness around your own ideology, which you have uh, passionate truth within, um, based on your empirical observations of reality, and based on your the knowledge that you've accrued over over years, and then that that philosophy associated with your name becomes some sort of ideology that then gets picked up by other people in the future and that they change it and then they re-script it and they, they build upon it and then it flowers out and inspires more people. And not only does it inspire people, but it it brings meaning and happiness to people's lives, to those people's lives. And whether that, because I've, I've looked into this quite interestingly, whether that's a delusion uh, or not, for me, it doesn't really matter because everything's a delusion. Every belief system, every ideology, every idea, every concept that anyone's ever come up with is a delusion. You say to me, oh, well, uh, I'm an atheist and I know, I know that there's no God. And I have this specific philosophy structured around atheism. Um, then, um, uh, and I take inspiration from these people in the past and these people are right. Um, well, I just say to you, no, they're not. You, you don't have a clue. You don't know. You don't know that. You you believe that. You believe that, but you don't know that. You you could, for all we know, you could just be deluded by the ideas that these people have created in the past, and those people could be deluded by a false observation on reality. That their, their empirical observations on reality might have been falsified in some way just because of their subjective mentality. Um, and so, and they probably are. So therefore, well, it's like, 
you know, we're all deluded. In, in my philosophy, this is my philosophy, everyone in the world is deluded by ideology. Everybody in the world is uh, possessed by the ideas that they hold as important based, for one, on their differentiated brain, based for two, possibly on some level of either superficial or possibly more grounded socialization, depending on your current thoughts and my own current thoughts on how prevalent socialization is compared with, let's say, um, an instinctual differentiation in the brain and the instincts and how they orient you. Um, and so if that's the case, we, we, we just all, there's, there's no hope. We're all just deluded. We're all just deluded in our own fashion, in our own way. Um, but, well, we say to that, well, should we be silent? Okay, so every time a new baby's born across the planet, we're all going to teach them just to be silent, and that's that. But in a sense, that's a delusion as well, because we think, well, maybe it's a delusion to be silent. Maybe we've got to that, because that's an idea. To be silent is an idea. To meditate is an idea. So maybe that's a delusion. So then what do you do? You mean, oh, well, I don't, I don't, God, I don't know what to do. So then we get back. If you follow that to its extent or its extreme, let's say, you get back to being deluded by the ideas you were originally going to be deluded by. So therefore, that's why I think, to be honest, you may as well just be deluded by the way in which your brain works and just go with that. Now, of course, that's not to say that maybe you shouldn't pick up some um, level of being humbled by the opposite ideology. For example, if you're strictly religious, it might be a good idea to read some books on atheism. Or if you're a strict atheist, it might be good to read some books on religion and humble yourself and not necessarily be prejudiced against those things when you're reading the books, but be open-minded. Be think, think, well, oh, well, actually, that's quite interesting. Or maybe when you're reading up on some religions, if you're an atheist, look about, look at, look at the rituals, look at the marriage ceremonies, look at the different things that they do and appreciate them for what they are, which is a cultural idea that's sprung up and that's been cemented over time, something that is ingrained within um, human society, human culture, over generation after generation after generation. It doesn't matter whether you believe in religion or not. That's not the point. You've missed the point. The point is to appreciate the dimension of human experience that you are being presented with, within the religion. Um, doesn't doesn't who cares if there's a God? Who cares if there's a God or if there isn't a God? It doesn't matter. That's total bollocks. We spend our lives, or some of us spend our lives, thinking, debating about this idea. Oh, well, is there something after death or isn't there? But it doesn't matter what there is or what there isn't. The fact is that right now there is what there is. And we shouldn't be prejudiced against trying to experience it one way, but experiencing it in multi in a multi-dimensional way. And of course, you're going to specifically go down your kind of roots and go down your the things that you are attracted to the most, um, again, as a, as a product of socialization or your brain structure. Um, but that's perfectly fine to have that, you know, and that's perfectly fine to be it's even perfectly fine, I would say, to be deluded in that way and not read into any other books on the opposing ideology. Um, but the only problem with that is if you're going to go down that delusion specifically and close yourself off to other ideas is that you are going to become quite assertive, aggressive, quite um, angry, you know, all, all this sort of stuff. And you're not going to like certain other dimensions of experience. So that's why I would say, you know, maybe open up to the other experiences. But ultimately, we're all deluded by ideas. Even if you open up to the other experiences, you're, you're only opening yourself up to new ways of deluding yourself with ideas or ideologies. So it's like, well, you know, just do what you do, you know, just do what you do. Um, and so that's what I do. I, I just speak what I'm speaking, I speak what I see, 
and someone will pick it up after I'm dead. And that's, in a way, causally speaking, that is my meaning. The fact that I have said these words, as soon as I say these words, through causality, it cements an experience by other people in the future who aren't alive yet that go to gain their meaning out of my meaning, um, out of the fact that I spoke, out of the fact that I said something. It's automatically that I create those people in the future and their kind of thought processes and their ways of experience based on my language. Now you might say, well, how the hell does that even work? Well, you think, okay, so I'm dead and gone, but I have cemented myself in video. Some guy in 2113 or something comes along and watches my videos. When they watch my videos, they have a specific uh, trait structure in their personality that aligns with my trait structure. And so what happens is that when they watch my videos, they get certain reactions, chemical, neurochemical reactions in the brain based on their differentiated brain, but go to give them ideas that formulate their own meaning and formulate their behavior and their action from that point onwards. And therefore, I create them just by as soon as I speak my words now, I have created them. Now, also, um, if let's say I didn't speak, they would then go off potentially and go down another another path. Uh, it'd be very, very likely that they would end up finding certain ideas that are associated to my ideology in other people in the past. Um, and therefore, they would have similar experiences to me just because of the way that they're, they're ma made, the way their brain works and things like that. But that's essentially how it happens. And it means that causally I've created that person, that their meaning, their ideology. It's like my words right now are a very, 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 very fine, complex structure and creation from Alan Watts, Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, these sorts of people that I've read that have given me certain neurochemical reactions that have gone to create thoughts that are in line with both my differentiated brain structure and the differentiated brain structure of those people in the past that I've mentioned and the experiences that they've had or some of the experiences that they've had have been replicated in a slightly different socialized setting um, and in a slightly different way because of being in a modern environment rather than in a past environment but those experiences are similar and that, that means that they, those people in the past have gone to create the person I am right now in terms of my thought process, in terms of my um, ability to perceive information or to perceive the world. Without Carl Jung, I wouldn't be able to have certain perceptions on reality that I have because it was him as an external stimulus that allowed my brain to organize information in a certain way. And again, this is more innate because it's based on the fact that my personality is, my personality structure is somewhat in line with Jung. So therefore, to the degree that my neurological structure is in line with Jung's and to the degree that my IQ is anywhere close to Jung's or to the degree that my op trait openness is anywhere close to Jung's, is the degree that I know Jung, is the degree that I know the, not only the ideology of that person, but the experiences of that person through their own neurochemical reactions in the brain. You see, that's what it is. That's how it works. And that's what you do when you assimilate the ideology of someone in a very, very profound and in-depth way. You are in a sense, using them as a as a form, as an idolizing form to orient yourself uh, towards. And if, if your brain structure 
is close to theirs, or in any way close to theirs, you can understand it, and it clicks, and, and you have the experiences that they experienced, and you go up from there, it's almost as if you uh, start to become them, in a way, and you've got to be careful of this, because it affects your behavior, it affects the words you use, it affects the way you write, it affects the way you speech. You see, uh, we could also say that Jordan Peterson affects me quite a lot, because you'll note in my speech and in the way I am, I'm, I'm very close to how he, how he is, and that's because, again, I've watched quite a lot of Peterson. So, it kind of, you become them, in a sense, if a, in a part. So this is why you have to be careful because that's almost like a sub facet of an archetype. So imagine you've got an archetype like the sage archetype or something like there and that you can have an individualized expression of that archetype. Then that's, you know, that's fine. That's all well and good. But it's not as simple as that. It's not as clear cut because we have all of these people throughout history who represent the sage archetype in individualized ways that have been kind of almost like kind of semi-socialized, but also from a genetic basis as well. So it's like partially that, partially the other. And they've individualized in a certain way and they've adopted certain behaviors and certain uh, things from their environment, and then what happens is the more you read those specific people, the more your behavior is adapted to those people's individualized patterns, but what you're actually doing is you're taking on board an individualized pattern of, uh, that, that is a representation of an archetypal form in the context of those people in the past, so what can happen is you can be almost a parody of an individualized expression of an archetype. For example, I could be a parody of Jung. I could be a parody of Jordan Peterson. I could be a parody of Alan Watts. Because what I'm actually doing is I've I've been so ingrained and, and absorbed into the individualized expression of the archetype rather than the archetype itself and then me create or, or the archetype itself creates an individualized expression that we then call my individualized expression of that archetype. Instead of that, I'm doing the opposite and I'm parody, parodying another person. Um, I don't know what, I've not read into, and this is something I want to do, I've not read into the concept of a meme, you know, the whole selfish gene thing by Richard Dawkins, um, but maybe there's some possible link to an individualized, uh, an individualized expression or parody of an archetype and the meme itself. Not that the meme is a substitute for the archetype, but that the meme is a subset of the archetype that is encapsulated within this kind of, in in between this individualized expression and the archetype itself. Um, but I'm not so certain because my ideology currently on the meme is that the meme and the archetype are describing the same real grounded phenomenon in the, in the world. Uh, and much like kind of neuropsychology um, talks about uh, personality based in, you know, certain brain structures, anatomical structures, physiological reactions, things like that, that create functions and that create, um, obviously, the, the individualized personality from the brain. The brain goes to create the mind. Um, just as they, the neuropsychologists, think about it in that way, the behaviorists think about personality as complex forms of behavior and complex patterns of behavior. But the behaviorists and the neuropsychologists, they're both in their rigid fields, in their boxes. But what, well, what some of them understand, and, you know, the intelligent ones understand, is that they're both describing the same phenomenon on reality, i.e. the personality, which is a real thing. But they're doing it in a different conceptual manner. And they're looking at it in a different manner. But it's the same thing. So therefore, the archetype and the meme, Richard Dawkins, the meme, Carl Jung's the archetype, it, it could be considered, although I would have to read into it a lot more, but it seems that it could be considered that those two things are hitting upon a real phenomenon, 
in the in the world empirically it's it's there it's real but they're just describing it in different ways and getting to a description of that actual real phenomena in different ways it's not to say that the archetype is necessarily correct it's not to say the meme is necessarily correct but they're just describing this phenomenon that is there in a certain way um and that's really the downfall of humanity because we always like to describe and we have to describe in our way um, and we have to cement things in the way we see them um, and that is a product of ourselves. And so um, therefore y you can never really have full understanding. You have to think, well, what am I going to go with? Am I going to go with this conception, that conception, this other conception? Or am I simply going to try my best not to go with any conception and just think, that's that. So anyway, well, <clears throat> oh, I've got a fog in my throat, man. Um, I've not used that saying in ages. That's a great saying, isn't it? Fog in your throat. Um, but no, so so getting back to this idea of money briefly, because we, uh, as always, we go off topic and then we come back to it. Uh, it's just the way of my style. I'm just, you know, just flow like that. Um, and it's not necessarily a good thing. It would be so brilliant if I was more structured, but, you know, can I be bothered writing a big structured list? Maybe a good thing would be to do bullet points. Have bullet points, by the side. I can't be bothered writing a huge structured list. It's not the way I work. But if I have bullet points, it might give me a bit more direction. So maybe we'll try bullet points one of these days. Um, but no, so I think there's too much attachment to this idea of money and, and not enough attachment to this idea of doing this thing that impassions you, that, that enlivens you, that makes you tick, that makes you want to get up and go. Um, it, it just seems silly, you know, it, it seems like a childish phenomenon. Uh, to cling to money, to have this rigid, fixed understanding of I'm going to get money or I'm going to do this, I'm going to get somewhere like this. I mean, yeah, well, get all the money in the world, but what's it really going to serve? It's not going to serve anything. It's going, well, I'll tell you what it's going to serve. It's going to serve your own arrogance in the end. That's all. You're just going to end up um, becoming more and more arrogant and more and more expecting of certain things. I've not got a first class ticket on this plane. Who's not booked me a first class ticket on this plane? You know, because by that time you probably got personal assistance and stuff. And oh, God, God forbid that one of those personal assistants doesn't buy you a first class ticket on that plane. You know, so y y you just get more expecting because you you've had this experience and of course, humans are like this. When we have an experience that we deem superior and then it gets taken away, then, you know, you're going to be pissed off. You're going to be like, well, well, why can't I have this experience again? So that's what it's going to serve. That's why there's some, and I don't know exactly how many, but there are certainly some rich people who don't actually do that much that's wealthy. They go on the plane in economy, they don't necessarily buy lavish food, they maybe indulge once in a while, which is perfectly fine, and that's uh, a good attitude, really. Uh, they don't necessarily have the most amazing house, but maybe it's a little bit better than other people's. And the reason is, they know that there's this kind of hedonistic treadmill, they know that there's this kind of expectation, this arrogance that comes with constantly wanting the best and constantly going round and round and round. It's funny because I thought about this uh, last night or the night before. I was eating a uh, protein bar. Now, I've had an incredible struggle with finding a good protein bar. A lot of the protein bars um, that I find, and I'm not talking about the real heavy duty ones with the chocolate or the god knows what you know and and they're like really you know for 30 grams of protein or something and to be honest we don't taste that nice because they're full of all different god knows what bits and bobs and all the rest of it and they try and pack them with so much protein that they have this just this weird taste of it 
So, you know, I'll, I've, I've occasionally got those and thought, well, then, you know, I'll have them, but I want something different. So, um, anyway, you know, I gave up with it for a while and I thought, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. I'm not, I don't need protein bars or anything like that. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not necessarily one of these big gym guys or anything. But I, uh, went to the supermarket one time and I found these protein bars and lucky for me, they didn't have all of these fruits and nuts and all the rest of it in. They were, uh... Fairly high in protein. It wasn't a requirement of mine to say that these things had to be vegan or gluten-free or anything like that, but that's what they were. Um, I wouldn't really care either way. But there was this salted caramel oat uh, trek bar, and it was like 9, 10 grams of protein. I thought, well, you know, it's not crazy high in protein, but that doesn't matter. That's okay. So I try these once and I think, oh, I like these, you know, these are good compared with many, many others I've tried. And, and this is the thing that I've wanted. And Trek have finally done this. Um, and I don't know why they are the first person to do this, but they've got a good, solid, nice oat-like flapjack bar with a layer of chocolate on top or a layer of salted caramel or I think we've got a strawberry and cream one or something like that. And it's nice. And it's edible, and it's just like eating a blooming flapjack instead of having one of these ones that has this weird taste to it. And you know what I mean, if you've ever eaten one of these high-brow protein bars, they have this weird taste to them. Uh, and they try and replicate the taste of chocolate or the taste of this or the taste of that, but they just can't do it. Or not to, the, to a higher degree, anyway. So I'm eating this bar and I'm thinking, you know, I've been eating these for quite a while now. I'd be pretty pissed off if these were to go out, uh, uh, you know, out of stock or they weren't to make them anymore. And I thought, bloody hell, I really would. And I've attached myself to the idea of having this protein bar because it's everything I've dreamed of. This protein bar, I want this protein bar. This is what I want. And so when you've had an ex a superior experience and then you're greeted, greeted with the the either the possibility or the reality that that's no longer going to be the case. Well, there's a little bit of anger there. There's a little bit of frustration. There's like, well, I wanted that experience. And the more and more this goes up the scale, protein bars are one thing, you know, but having a, a chauffeur drive you somewhere or, as I say, having an expensive plane ticket or an expensive hotel room, and you don't get that after a long time of having it, after two years or three years or five years of having it, well, you're going to be pissed off as hell. And you're going to want to get that back. And that's going to make you angry. And that's going to drive you. But it's going to drive you in a very, very negative way. It's going to drive you to beat other people. It's going to drive you to... to not necessarily be very empathetic or sympathetic to other people's situation. It's going to make you feel as if you deserve that because you had it for so long. And, well, I had that for so long. I worked for that and I got that and, and I should have that. And you see what that expectation does to a person. It makes them angry. It makes them aggressive. It almost possesses them by... um a certain instinct, by a certain archetype, as we would say. We would say that it's a, a very negative expression of the instinct for dominance. It's, it's in archetypal terms, in sort of the, the subjective idea, it would be the villain. It would be the negative side of the hero. Um, it would be someone who wants to get their way because they're expectant. They have the expectation of the negative pole of the divine child. They wish to get their thing, their way. Uh, and so that that's what fuels it. And you can see in my story of the, the protein bars, this subtle expectation there, you see, of me trying to find a bar that fits my specific criteria or my specific want or desire. And it's in these very, very subtle ways that it's not necessarily archetypal forms that pervade our existence necessarily, but 
we can speak about is generally as if expectation or certain ideas, certain things direct us and certain things push us to a certain negative or positive outcome of experience or um, behavior as well. We don't necessarily need to consider it in archetypal terms because we can can consider it in more general terms. Because there's this kind of thing in, in Jungian psychology where when you get more of a understanding of the archetypes in a very fine way, you can start to label everything an archetypal experience. And it's not that that's not the case, because it is in a way. But also, because the archetypal experience is so, so fine, it doesn't need to be categorised as an archetypal experience, but rather it's probably easier to categorise it as, you know, something in general speech. Um, You see, whether you're going to say, and this isn't necessarily a fine understanding of the archetypes, but it's an understanding of how the archetypes work, as I've talked about before with this idea of the crush, you see, we don't need to say anima projection necessarily. We just say it's a crush, but we're talking about the same phenomenon. Whether we say crush or whether we say anima projection, it's the same thing. The, the anima projection, the projection onto another of being enraptured by someone, by something within your own psyche, that is a crush. In high school, when you uh, you know, have a specific person that you like. Generally, you don't really like them, but uh, you 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 think you like them. You really, really think I be- I love this person, and I really like this person. But it's just a crush. But we would say in Jungian terms, that's an anima projection. But then, if we start to do this so frequently, and we start to do this so minutely with every experience, we start to build up an entire new. Uh, language system based on language that we already have to describe the things. So, you see, that it's actually more easier and it's, it's more efficient in terms of communication to actually just use the words that we are familiar with. But the thing is, behind the words that we are familiar with, that we use to describe such experiences, are the actual psychological happenings um, that then we describe in a Jungian manner, in whatever, you know, in whatever manner we want. Um, But we don't, you know, we don't need to do that. It's not something that we need to do because the experience is the same either way. The saying, well, there's this kind of expectation arising here is the same as saying that we've got this negative association to the divine child, whether that be in a very, very, very finite way, or whether that be in a in a more cemented way in an actual complex within that individual in, individual. But whether we say expectation or whether we say this, it's the same the same experience. You're having that same experience, whether you label it this way or that way. And really, it could be put down as well. Um, I don't know whether it could be put down to archetypal reductionism, actually. It might be. It could be put down to archetypal reductionism because we can't validate 100% whether that experience is actually fully an archetypal experience. We can postulate and we can hypothesize in a certain manner of ex- uh, of speaking. And if we are to really observe that experience empirically quite in detail, then we could potentially see more clearly uh, a psychic happening, uh, a happening of the psyche that relates to a specific archetype. And then we can see more clearly how those specific words that we use relate um, to an archetypal experience behind those words, but that we use certain words in common speech to uh, actually just represent those archetypal experiences without even particularly realizing that those words can be associated with such an experience. So it is very possible that um, there is an element of archetypal reductionism in there and that we are therefore much better um, 
actually defining the experience in normal terms, in normal speech, rather than in archetypal terms. But there are certainly instances where an archetypal understanding uh, can be warranted and can be can think, well, with regards to the crush, we can clearly associate that with an anima or animus projection. But with other things, they're a little bit more finer. Unless we can clearly see certain things or we can know that that person has a certain association with certain archetypes within experience and and from things that are directing their behavior and as I say we can really see that then it's it is a little bit reductionist to say well this experience is relating to this this experience is relating to the other um so yeah anyway so that's that uh we're nearly an hour so I should probably get off now oh god I am so tired, and it's only half eleven. I need to stop eating all of these terrible diet things that I'm eating at the moment. Um, so, uh, that was a little bit about money. That was a little bit on um, how money can change you as well and can kind of... I suppose it's the whole money is the root of all evil, very, very old saying, you know, and that's how it is the root of all evil. This We all know this, the the expectation, the um, the desire, the desire, the desire. And again, it just goes back to, to Buddhism as well. Um, desire is the builder of the house. Desire is the thing that um, essentially gives us a suffering, gives us attachment, um, gives us dukkha, which is suffering. Um, so it's... You know, it go it all it bleeds into all these different things, whether it's Christianity or Buddhism or or Zen as well. Well, Zen obviously being a form of Buddhism, uh, Taoism, um, all of these different traditions, all the world religions say something about money in a negative connotation like that, or not necessarily money, but generally, you know, attachment in some form like that. Um, and and therefore we do have to recognise that, we have to acknowledge that, and we also have to acknowledge the fact that so many philosophers have talked about it in such a way as well. It's not a trivial thing, it's something that is um, actually very important and something that should be considered and recognised because if we don't recognise it, then we risk kind of falling back um, and we risk kind of ignorance um, and we risk kind of this hatred uh, and that's not a necessarily a good thing so I'll leave it there thank you very much for watching guys and I suppose I will see you in the next one so see you very soon guys mm -hmm.